Welcome back, Andrew Posadas, Jimmy Sullivan with you, and now pleased to be joined by Howard Berman. He is an author and the author of a new book called The Mutt's Dream, Making the Mick. Howard, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Doing pretty well, thank you for asking. And this book examines the life and times and specifically the relationship between Mickey Mantle and his father as they grew up in Oklahoma. What was that relationship like? How could you describe that to us? Well, when I first got started with the book, I thought, you know, I'm going to find the story of an abusive father who pushed the son into doing something that maybe he wanted, maybe he didn't want to do, but drove him, drove him, drove him. Not the case, really. Mickey and Mutt got along really, really well. Mickey wanted to please his father, loved his father. And I think that's one of the things that drove his insecurity all of his life, he all, even after his father died. I mean, Mutt's dream was to turn Mickey into a baseball player, as we all know. Mutt worked in the mines in Oklahoma. It was a terrible job. He worked deep in the mines. It was a lead and zinc mine. And he thought, you know, I only know how to do two things that I could pass on to my son. I could teach him to be a minor, I could teach him to be a baseball player. I think I'll teach him to be a baseball player. Mutt himself was a pretty good player. And so that was his dream before Mickey was even born. You probably know the stories that, you know, he threw baseballs into the, the baby's crib, into Mickey's crib when he was days old and uh, his mother kept taking the balls out and hiding them and Mutt kept getting more and throwing them in there, throwing them in there. He thought that, hey, Mickey's got to be around the ball. That's going to help him become a baseball player. Now, he was lucky that Mickey had the talent, of course. There's a lot of people push their sons into, <laughs> into athletic sports that don't have the abilities. My father pitched to me till his arm fell off, but my career came up, you know, just a little bit short of Mickey's. Actually, it came up short of making my high school baseball team, but that's another story. Yeah, they got along pretty well. Howard, it's interesting because this isn't the only time we've seen a story about a father pushing his son or his daughter, especially when it comes to sports and the entertainment world. I think about just most recently, somebody like LeVar Ball, who is the mouthpiece for his son early on in his collegiate career and when he first started with the Lakers. What surprise, is there anything that surprises you about this story, considering that we see this all the time with fathers putting pressures on, on their children or even mothers, but just the essential idea that parents put that pressure on their children in order to get the best out of them. It was interesting because Mickey had uh, three brothers uh, and a sister, and Mutt didn't work with any of them uh, to do what he did with Mickey. I mean, he'd play with them sometimes, but you know, he, didn't, he didn't drive them. Mickey lived at a time when they had no money to speak of. It was dirt poor. Uh, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have running water for, for many of the years. And so there wasn't a lot to engage them in this little tiny town. Uh, I mean, he moved to Commerce. We call him the Commerce Comet, but that was later. That was when he was in, going into school. But in the early days, they lived in a little town called Pitcher and Spavanaugh, and there was nothing there. So playing baseball was the one thing that they could do. And it's the one thing they could talk to each other about. I think fathers playing catch with their sons is elemental in America. I know, I think probably a lot of people had the same experience. When I was young, what could I talk to my father about? I didn't know his business. I couldn't talk about the stock market. I couldn't talk about nuclear arms or anything else that was important in the world. But boy, I could talk about baseball. And that's where we met. We met, if you will, in, in the middle in, in talking baseball. And we'd get up every morning and, and read the, the box scores. And in those days before we have all the, the, the data that we have today, you know, the box scores was a, was a short story in itself. You could really tell the story of the game looking at the box score. So what surprised me, I think, was that how close that relationship was, and it was always centered on uh, baseball. I, I wanted to be able to talk to his, uh, his, his brothers. I uh, couldn't, couldn't do that uh, because they were gone. But I, I really wondered how they felt about uh, Mutt spending all the time with Mickey and not with them, and I don't know the answer to that. Howard, uh, Mickey Mantle's father, Mutt, died in 1952 when Mickey was 20 or 21. Obviously, the loss of a parent is a very crushing blow in somebody's life. Did Mickey feel that? And you know, I don't know to what extent you talk to family members or whatnot, but did he, to what extent did he feel that when he was a young player, his father passing away at a young age? I, you know, Mutt never, Mutt never lived to see the dream, as you just said. Uh, you know, he worked all of his life to do this, and Mickey 
as we know, turned out to be a fairly decent baseball player. And Mutt, Mutt never had the experience of that happening whatsoever. And I think that was absolutely essential to Mickey's demeanor from that point on. I think all of his life he felt he had to live up to Mutt. He had to make Mutt proud. He wanted to do what Mutt wanted him to do. And I think that's part of what led him to his alcohol, to becoming an alcoholic and other things was, I got to deal with this pressure, this incredible pressure of living up to my father, not to mention the fact that he was replacing DiMaggio, Ruth, uh, and uh, uh, Derrick as the three great Yankees. It's not like, you know, he was replacing Andy Pafko or something with the Dodgers. He was replacing three of the, the greats of all time. You know, I've, I've said in another book that baseball is a ghost story. We're always, baseball players are always living in the shadows of the ghosts of those people that came before. And he did that. And one of the ghosts in his life clearly was his father's influence. And, and he, he was devastated, obviously, when his father died. And he struggled to live up to that. Never felt that he did completely. And I think he always felt a little bit guilty that he didn't do more. He was not as secure a person as a lot of people think he was. I mean, he came, comes on really sometimes as cocky and secure. And he, in, in a lot of ways, he wasn't. He was, he, was, he was shy and insecure. We know as a kid he was shy. He wet his bed till he was older. He didn't deal with girls very well. He was sexually molested. Uh, he, had, uh, he had to hide that and not talk to his friends about that. So he was not a very secure guy. Yeah, and Howard, just for you personally, how has your perception of Mickey Mantle changed as a, a young baseball fan and just living in that moment and going through his career then to now having done the research, having seen and been told all of these stories of Mickey and his relationship with his father, how has your perception changed, if any at all, from when you were younger to now after having written this book? Yeah, it, it, it makes him into a person, a real guy. I mean, he, his childhood was not, well, I mean, it was not unlike a lot of kids' childhood other than the fact that he had to play baseball with his father every night when he came home. But he did all the other things that boys do, and it was fun to see that. He went swimming, although he couldn't swim. Uh, maybe he wasn't a good enough athlete, I don't know. Uh, and, and they had to pull him out of the water a couple of times with his buddies, and you know, they would play uh, board games when it was raining. Uh, he was a, ba he was a, a good uh, 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 pitcher. On the, on the high school team, which I never realized. He was a running back on the football team and set all sorts of records in the conference. He was a great running back. We know his speed. I mean, he was, he was fast and he, and he was strong. So that colored it. But also, you know, he had that terrible incident where he was kicked in the, in, the, in the shin, got osteomyelitis, goes into the hospital. The doctors come in after several days of trying to treat it, and they tell his parents, we're going to have to take the leg off. Uh, and Mutt melted on the spot, and his uh, Mickey's wife, uh, Mickey's mother, uh, Lovell, said, "You ain't taking that leg off now. You ain't taking it off tomorrow. You ain't taking it off any day." She was a firebrand, and they didn't. But I thought it was interesting to see him as a as a guy, as a kid, doing things we all do, uh, you know, playing ball, but playing board games and swimming and doing all the stuff that a kid does. Interestingly enough, and no one's asked this in, in an interview, but interestingly enough, he did some theater when he was in high school. He was in two plays, but he was so shy, he would only do either very small parts or parts where he could do it from off stage and call on stage as an off stage voice or something while his buddies were on stage. He, he was very shy, and I, I didn't realize that so much. Let, let me follow up on that, Howard. How much do you think, you know, going through his career, and you talked about he kind of had a larger-than-life persona when he was alive, and he came off in a certain way as being very self-assured, very confident. But yeah. how much do you think that shyness and that character trait really affected him as he went through his life? Huge. I mean, I think it was the dominant issue in his life as he, as he, as he got older. You know, later in his life, <clears throat> he, he said a number of times, you've probably seen the interviews, he said, I was a lousy role model kids, don't be like Mickey. I mean, I just didn't do it right. He was, he was rude. He was hurtful to friends and fans. He was an alcoholic. Uh, but he sought to make amends at the end. He sought, I think he came, uh, Costa said this, but he, and Costa said so many things about Mickey that was so accurate. But one of the things he said was, Mickey finally learned to appreciate the distinction between a role, being a role model and a hero. And he may be, he wasn't such a great he, uh, role model. He was an awfully good, he was an awfully good hero. No, but I think that drove him 
all of his life. Uh, I, there was one, I'll tell this very quickly if you have the time. It was an interesting story <clears throat> that Mickey told at some point. He was at Mickey's bar in New York on, on Central Park uh, South, and a woman came in who had been a, a, a very wealthy woman who had uh, donated some money to some causes that Mickey had supported and said, is there any way you could come to my husband's birthday party? It's only a few blocks away off of Fifth Avenue. That would mean the world to him. You are his hero. You are the greatest thing that he, that, that, that he knows. And for whatever reason, Mickey said, yeah, okay, I'll go if you donate some more money to this charity. And she said, sure, I'll do that. So Mickey shows up at this party on Fifth Avenue, and it's filled with people. He walks in the door, and here's this man who was in his 80s at the time who idolized Mickey, and he starts crying. Mickey's in his presence. And Mickey said later, can you imagine that? I'm an alcoholic. I'm nothing. I'm just, I'm beyond redemption at this point. And here's a man crying to see me. I should be crying to see him. He's done so many good things, and I haven't. I thought it was an interesting story. And Howard, how much do you think being in New York played a factor in how Mickey's post-career would come out? the alcohol, the partying, just being around such a huge market. And we all know how New York was back then. How big of an influence do you think that was on him and on other Yankee greats like Babe Ruth, like a Joe DiMaggio? A huge, a huge, huge impact. But people deal with stress in different ways. And, you know, every baseball player has some stress. There's no question about it. You're in, you're in the public eye as a baseball player, and you're going to be, it's going to be stressful. But he had even more stress than a lot of baseball players, as you say, New York. New York had more newspapers in those days than any city in probably in the world, uh, certainly in the United States. They were covering them all the time. They loved to find dirt. We know the back pages of the tabloids. Did anything, do anything wrong, and it's going to be all over the back pages of the tabloids. And when he got older, he got into trouble because he, he was a, a, a greeter at a, a casino in the Atlantic City, and the, the papers all went nuts about that, and he was kicked out of baseball for a while by the commissioner and then, and then reinstated. I think it was a huge influence on him. And the other influence, of course, is the availability of all the things that he, got, he fell into. I mean, New York, I think, has a couple of bars. Uh, they've got a whole lot of nightclubs. And, uh, uh, you know, Pitcher didn't have that when he grew up. Uh, uh, but he, he fell into that. And then we all know that Whitey Ford and Billy Martin, his two great drinking buddies, were not particularly good influences on his life, particularly Billy, but Whitey also to a certain degree. Uh, Billy was incorrigible and, you know, was, well, you know, you all know those stories later on. Yeah, I think it's huge. I think had he gone to play in, in St. Louis, for example, it would have been a whole different situation. St. Louis was the closest uh, major league city to where he grew up in, in those days. And all the fans are in that part of Oklahoma. Most of them were St. Louis fans. I think he would have had family and friends around that would have supported him in a way that he didn't have in New York. Probably the worst place in the world he could have gone was from Pitcher, Oklahoma to New York City. Howard, let me ask because you alluded to it before. Yeah. You talked about how Mickey Mantle had a lot of struggles in his post-career, and then towards the end of his life in the 90s, he started to try to make amends with a lot of things that had gone wrong. Um, in terms of the relationship with his father, and you talked about how he tried to uh, please his father his entire life, do you ever think he made peace with that in the last couple of years of his life or not? I'd like to think so, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I think maybe at the very end he, he might have. I, I really couldn't, I, 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 I couldn't say, but I know that that drove him in those years. I know that that was of concern to him. And I think when maybe he apologized at the end to the kids and said, don't be like me, maybe he had his father in mind. I'd like to think so. And just looking forward, after writing this book, you've written other books on baseball, Shoeless Joe Jackson, is there another story now that you're done with this particular one? Is there another story out there that you're itching to write at? Or do you have any ideas of another sports story out there that deserves its spotlight? <laughs> it's funny, interesting you should bring that up. I've been struggling with that for days now that the book is out and doing well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say. And I'm, I'm toying with a, a very similar book. My book is different from so many of the books about Mickey because it's, it's written like a I'm a playwright. It's written like a playwright. It's a lot of dialogue. It is mostly dialogue. And I did that on purpose uh, to try to show how the characters develop through 
through their interaction with other characters and not do it as a, as a, as a narrative description. Well, Mickey did this and he was shy. I'd rather show him being shy by having a girl come in and say, I don't know how to, I don't know where we're going to go tonight or, or something like that. So I, dialogue is, is what I do best. And, and that's what I'm considering. I'm thinking about, <clears throat> and it may be too close to this book. That's what I'm not completely sure about. I'm really thinking of doing a book about Willie, Mickey, and the Duke in the 50s, all three of the great, great, great center fielders of all time, and do it from that perspective, not a narrative description of what they did and not really concentrating on their baseball careers, although that would be a part of it, but dealing with the problems that they all three had and they all did uh, and the things that they overcame and they all did. They all had fathers, by the way, interesting, similar to Mutt. Uh, Mickey, uh, Willie had Cat, and uh, Duke had a, a, his father's name, Ward. They were all uh, laborers uh, in the steel mill or the uh, tire factory or, or the mine. So there's similarities, but there are also uh, obviously differences, and there are concerns about them. So I'm just thinking about doing a personal story about the three of them, not so much uh, their baseball careers. People know that, although that might be a part. Of, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm trying to toy with my publisher to see whether he thinks that's too close to to the Mickey book, uh, maybe to do something else. But uh, does that sound interesting at all? Yeah. I, I was not Absolutely. born in the 50s, so I would love to hear anything I can about sports back then. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we look forward to that. That's Howard Berman. He's the author of Mutt's Dream, Making the Mick, about the life and times of Mickey Mantle and the relationship with his father, Mutt. Howard, thank you so much for taking some time with us. Best of luck to you and uh, continued success. Appreciate your time, thank Howard. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it, guys. You asked good questions.